In August 1967, John Lennon and biographer Hunter Davies were hanging together at John's Kenwood home in Weybridge. At the time, Davies was collecting material for an authorized biography of the Beatles, when the sudden seed of inspiration for a great song came about, as it most often did from the most banal moments. We were swimming round the pool at John's house and several streets away, you could hear a police siren going da 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 and John started humming this and playing with those two notes. He got that on the piano and they had a go at that later that evening. They did a backing track and a few other things. The rhythm has stayed in his head and he was playing with putting words to it. Mr. City, policeman sitting pretty but he hadn't got much further. He said it would be the basis for a song, but there was no need to develop it now. It could be dragged out next time he needed a song. In the early days, John would have been quick to finish a song right then and there, like a true tunesmith. That's how John and Paul used to work then. But now, this more mature and patient Lennon worked whenever his spirit moved him, adding one line at a time. That's how I Am The Wars was constructed. He'd written down another few words that day, just staff words, to put to another bit of rhythm. Sitting on a cornflake, waiting for the man to come. I thought he said, Van to come, which he hadn't, but he liked it better and said he'd use it instead. He also had another piece of music in his head. This had started with the phrase, sitting in an English country garden. This is what John does for at least two hours every day, sitting on the step outside his window and looking at his garden. This time, thinking about himself doing it, he repeated the phrase over and over till he'd put a tune to it. At the time, John didn't know if the two bits of music he had were going to be the same song, which is what happened. We turned to John's longtime friend Pete Shodden to shed more light on the lyrics. One afternoon, while taking lucky dips into the day sack of fan mail, John, much of both our amusement and surprise, chanced to put out a letter from a student at Quarry Bank. Following the usual expressions of adoration, this lad revealed that his literature master was playing Beatles songs in class. After the boys all took their turns analyzing the lyrics, the teacher would weigh in with his own interpretation of what the Beatles were really talking about. This, of course, was the same institution of learning whose headmaster has summed up young Lennon's prospects with the words, this boy's bound to fail. John and I howled together in laughter over the absurdity of it all. Pete, he said, what's that dead dog Zai's song we used to sing when we were at the quarry bank? I thought for a moment and it all came back to me. Yellow metacosta, green slop pie, all mixed together with a dead dog Zai. Slap it on a butty, ten foot thick, then wash it down with a cup of coal sick. That's it, John said. Fantastic. He found a pen and commenced scribbling. The thought of school studying the Beatles lyrics was incredibly amusing to John, not only because he hated the school system, but also because he was always considered a failure in traditional academic pursuits. So because of this letter from a student from Quarry Bank, John and Pete's original school when they formed the Quarryman group, John, being the troll that he is, began purposefully inserting the most ludicrous imagery his imagination could conjure into the lyrics. He thought of semolina, a pudding he'd been forced to eat as a kid, and pilchard, a sardine you'd feed to a cat. Semolina pilchard, climbing up the Eiffel Tower, John wrote down laughing. He turned to Pete saying, let the fuckers work that one out, Pete. The sender of the original letter to John, Stephen Bailey, received the letter from John in September 1967, which was later sold at auction in 1992. In those days, John was very inspired by Bob Dylan and purposefully wrote in an obscure way, never saying what he actually meant, but hiding many clues in the words, which more or less could be read into it. He did later call this approach artsy-fartsy crap, suggesting that this was a cowardly and pretentious way of expressing oneself. There has been more said about Dylan's wonderful lyrics than was ever in the lyrics at all. Mine too. But it was the intellectuals who read all this into Dylan or the Beatles. Dylan got away with murder. I thought, 
I can write this crap too. You just take a few images together and thread them together and you call it poetry. I was just using the mind that wrote in his own right to write that song. As it turns out, the lyrics weren't just scribble nonsense, at least not underneath the surface. John explained many times in detail the hidden meaning behind some of the words. Part of it was putting down Hare Krishna. All these people were going on about Hare Krishna, Allen Ginsberg in particular. The reference to elementary penguin is the elementary naive attitude of going around chanting Hare Krishna or putting all your faith in one idol. Lewis Carroll was a big influence on John and Paul, especially by that time, and it shows. Paul once said that when they were both writing Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, Lewis Carroll was a big influence on the imagery. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds also gets a nod in the lyric, see how they fly like Lucy in the sky. John frequently added those little nods to his songs. But funny enough, the walrus imagery was completely accidental and John made a mistake when he wanted to refer to the carpenter in Carol's story. The walrus comes from the walrus and the carpenter. To me, it was a beautiful poem. It never dawned on me that Lewis Carroll was commenting on the capitalist system. I never went into that bit about what he really meant, like people are doing with the Beatles' work. But that wouldn't have been the same, would it? I am the carpenter. We saw the movie, and the walrus was a big capitalist that ate all the f***ing oysters. I always had the image of the walrus in the garden, and I loved it, so I didn't ever check what the walrus was. He's a f bastard, that's what he turns out to be. But the way it's written, everybody presumes that means something. I mean, even I did. We all just presume that because I said I am the walrus, it must mean I am God or something. It's just poetry, but it became symbolic of me. What about the Eggman? John never acknowledged who the Eggman was or if there was one. For that, we turn to Eric Burden of Animals in War fame, who claims he is the real Eggman John refers to. We had some great times together, something John gave a nod to on his song I Am The Wars. It may be one of my more dubious distinctions, but I was the Eggman, or as some pals call me, Eggs. The nickname stuck after a wild experience I'd had at the time with a Jamaican girlfriend named Sylvia. I was early one morning cooking breakfast, naked except for my socks, and she slid up behind me and crapped up an amyl nitride capsule under my nose. As the fumes set my brain alight and I slid to the kitchen floor, she reached the counter and grabbed an egg, which she broke into the pit of my belly. The white and yellow of the egg ran down my naked front, and Sylvia began to show me one Jamaican trick after another. I shared the story with John at a party at a Mayfair flat one night with a handful of blondes and a little Asian girl. Go on, go get it, Eggman. Lennon laughed as we tried the all too willing girls on for size. I think it's very possible that this stuck in John's conscience and he eventually added it to Walrus as he would usually do. Engineer Jeff Emmerich offers a funny and fascinating perspective on when John first showed I Am The Walrus to the others at the studio. Lennon sang in a dull monotone, strumming his acoustic guitar as we all gathered around him in the dim studio light. Everyone seemed bewildered. The melody consisted largely of just two notes and the lyrics were pretty much just nonsense. For some reason, John appeared to be singing about a walrus and an Eggman. There was a moment of silence when he finished, then Lennon looked up at George Martin expectantly and John said, so what do you think? George looked perplexed, for once he was at a loss for words. Well John, to be honest, I have only one question, what the hell do you expect me to do with that? There was a round of nervous laughter in the room, which partly dissipated the tension, but Lennon was clearly not amused. Frankly, I thought George's remark was out of line. To me, the Beatles seemed a bit lost, as if they were looking for another place to be, a new start. And even in its raw state, I could hear that the song had potential. George Martin, however, simply couldn't get past the limited musical content and outrageous lyrics. He flat out didn't like the song. As John sang provocative lines about a pornographic priestess and letting knickers down, George turned to me and whispered, What did he say? 
He couldn't believe his ears, and after the experience the Beatles had gone through with Lucy in the sky with diamonds and a day in the life, I guess he was worried about more censorship problems from the BBC. But despite George's misgivings, the Beatles were determined to work on the song, so they began running down the basic track. George Martin became even more exasperated when it became apparent that Ringo was having trouble holding the beat steady. For the first few takes, Paul played bass as usual, but then he opted to switch to tambourine, standing directly in front of Ringo, effectively acting as both a cheerleader and a human click track. In the end, Ringo gave a strong performance, but even listening to the record today, you can hear that they're distracted and that their minds are not really on what they're doing. I distinctly remember the look of emptiness on all their faces while they were playing I'm the Walrus. It's one of the saddest memories I have of my time with the Beatles. Walrus was recorded on several days in September 1967, the 5th, 6th and later on the 27th, 28th and 29th. In the early stages, it featured an extra bar prior to the Yellow Master Custard verse, which caused the group some problems when recording. They were supposed to play a C major 7th chord, doing the bar as a transition back to the verse, as heard in Anthology 2, but had trouble remembering the change. The bar was eventually removed during the editing stage. One time, when George Martin was working with John on a vocal track, he noticed, Look, you've been singing now for about 7 hours, you're beginning to sound hoarse, why don't we do it tomorrow? But John said no, because he wanted to get it done that day, and that's why his voice sounds so raw on the vocal track. There was some controversy about what the choir was chanting at the end of the song. Actually, the choir sang, everybody's got one, everybody's got one. Got one meaning, according to Lennon, that we are all the same. However, you can't really understand what they're saying when there are 30 people, male and and female on top of 30 cellos and the rock and roll rhythm section of the Beatles. Ray Thomas and Mike Pinder of the Moody Blues also took part in his vocal overdub. The BBC radio feed, including a radio production of King Lear by William Shakespeare, was added during this last session. We did about half a dozen mixes, and I just used whatever was coming through at the time. I never knew it was King Lear until years later somebody told me, because I could hardly make out what they were saying. The filming of the I'm the War sequence took place just days after the song was finished, sometime between September 19th and 24th, 1967, and John went on to say it was one of his favorite Beatle tracks.